All right, if you were here this morning, you heard the sermon and what I'm going to be going into tonight. If you weren't here this morning, then good luck. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this morning I preached on the love of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And we kind of went over, you know, the love that God has for us and, and how just immeasurable that love is. And that's, that's awesome. But what we're going to be focusing on tonight now is our love to God. And how do we then respond when we understand that God loves us? What should we do? Obviously, we should love God in kind. We should love him in turn and, and we should show our love to him. Well, the Bible tells us how we should go about doing that because love is not just a feeling. You know, the world's going to tell you and kind of talk about love in some real nondescript ways oftentimes and it just kind of associate love with just being this feeling or an attraction that you have towards somebody and just not really do a good job of laying it down. But the Bible actually gives us many ways and, and many um, properties of love and, and, and how you can um, show God that you love him. So we're going to go through that this evening. We're going to show, you know, go through these things where, where the Bible tells us how we can love God. And in the Matthew 22, where we started, I want to look down in verse number 36, where the Bible says, Master, which is the great commandment in the Lord? There's someone coming to Jesus and calling him, Master, what is the great commandment? If there's a great commandment in the Bible and God's word, what is it? Now, those of you who are memorizing Deuteronomy chapter 6 should recognize the answer that Jesus Christ gives to him. He says in verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That's what he's quoting. So if you haven't been getting involved with the memory verse, this is there's a very good reason. I mean, this is the great commandment, right? The number one commandment is part of our memory verse. So, so try to get that down. Even if you don't get the whole chapter, start learning it. Start remembering. That's early on. It's like verse 3 or 4. Excuse me, 4. All right. I don't get the, the, the verses are kind of long at the beginning, but <laughs> verse four. That's right. Here, therefore, O Israel, verse three. Well, four and five. Right. They're combined. So you've been doing really good with the numbers. You know exactly what numbers you're on. Sorry, I'm going to get off on that. I don't have all the numbers memorized. I just memorized the passage. So um, Jesus says to him here, he answers, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So that's the great commandment, is that we should love God. And that's what we're going to be preaching tonight, is us loving God. And then he says, you know, this is the first and great commandment. You know, you get this down, that's the first and great commandment. Then he says, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Both of the commandments he gives have to do with love. Right. Loving God, loving man. Loving God, loving your neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Sounds like it's pretty important. I mean, if, if all of the law and the prophets are just resting and hanging on these two basic principles, loving God and loving man, this is pretty important. So let's figure out that first and great commandment. And that's what I'm going to be focused on. We're going to touch a little bit on, you know, loving your neighbor, but the, the focus and the thrust is going to be mostly just how do we show God that we love him? How can we love God? And the, the reasoning behind, well, how can all the commandments, I mean, there's a lot of commandments in the Bible, how can they all hang on just these two things? As we get into it, you'll see why when he defines what love is and how you know that you're loving God. Turn to 1 John chapter 3, because as I mentioned before, love is more than just a feeling. You, you talk to a lot of people, and if you ask them to say, do you love God? Many, the majority of people out there today are going to say, of course, I love God. Right? What do you mean, do I love God? Of course I love God. But do they really love God? You know, what, what comes out of their mouth and what their concept of loving God is in their mind doesn't always match up with what the scripture says about loving God. Look at John, 1 John chapter 3. Verse number 16, the Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, 
because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So verse 16 says, this is how we understand, this is how we perceive the love of God, that because he laid down his life for us, he, Jesus Christ died and offered up himself as a sacrifice for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So in turn, here's our example. What's the example? The way that God loves us. Okay, well then we ought to have that same love. We ought to reciprocate that love in kind. Now, obviously, we don't lay down our life like for God to, to help God out or to save God, but we lay down our lives for the brethren. Right? We lay down our lives for other people. So that's how we, <coughs> when we perceive the love of God, the same love that we ought to be able to have for other people. It's, that's being totally selfless when you're willing to give your life. And that's, you know, and that's the amount of love that we're being taught that we should have. Look at verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He's saying, we see how God loved us and that's how we, you know, we ought to give our lives for brother. But then you have somebody who has this world's good? What is it talking about? Someone who's, who has wealth, who just had this world's good. They've got some money. They've got things. They're comfortable. And his brother has a need. His brother, his own brother, his brother in Christ, his spiritual brother, he's going through our times. He's got a need. And yet he shuts up his compassion. Oh. Too bad for you. You deal with that. Right? Tough luck. Sorry, guy. How dwell the love of God in him? If Jesus is willing to give his own life for us, and you're just going to, you have the world. You have what this person needs, and you're just not going to help him out. You're not going to give it to him. Now, this isn't talking about just some bum on the street that doesn't want to work. That's not what this is referring to. This isn't saying that you just have to give your money to some bum on the street that's totally able-bodied yep. and capable of working but just refuses to work. Right. Don't be deceived. That's not what this verse is talking about. But when you've got a brother, you've got a, a fellow brother in Christ that, because look, let's face it, sometimes people go through hard times and it's not the result of their laziness or drug addiction or drunkenness. It's, Hey, they got fired. Maybe they got fired for righteousness sake. Maybe they're being persecuted. Maybe they've got a need and it has nothing to do with their own sin or their own mess that they're getting themselves into. That happens a lot. I mean, what if someone gets robbed? What if, you know, you go through all kinds of what ifs. There's many situations where, where people go through and they have a, a, a problem and they, and they need, they, they're deserving of having compassion on but then you, as a brother in Christ, you shut up your compassion. You're saying, well, how does the love of God dwell in you? How can you say that you have the love of God? Not even close. Verse 18, the Bible says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. And you've been going to church for a while. You'll get all kinds of talk on how people love you and, oh, brother, I'm praying for you and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And you might hear it, but are people actually doing? You know, how many times do you hear people just say, oh, yeah, I'm praying for you, I'll pray for you, and they use a spiritual language. But do you ever wonder, like, are they really going home and praying? Now, I believe that the people here love God and if, you say, if, you, if they say they're going to do something, they're going to do it. But one of the problems in general with a lot of churches and hopefully our church never becomes this way. And hopefully it's not this way right now. I don't know. I don't have, you know, I was joking about privacy before, but it's not like we have cameras set up in your house or anything like that. Um, you actually do have privacy from us. I'm not going to say the same thing about the government, but um, I don't know what you do. God knows whether when you say you're going to do something, you're actually doing it. God knows our God sees what you're doing, if you're loving indeed or just in word only. The problem with, with loving in word only is that it doesn't do anybody any good. And just makes you a liar. Because if you say you love somebody, but you just have no action for it, you're, you're a liar. You're a hypocrite. 
And this, that reminds me of like James chapter 2, where he's saying, you know, if someone comes to you and they say, you know, and you say, oh, be warmed and be filled. And someone comes to you, they don't have any food and they're naked. And you say, oh, yes, be warm, be filled. But then you don't give them the things that they need. Right. You're just a big stinking hypocrite. Right. And, and you're just talking and saying things, but you're not actually following through with that. The love comes in with your action, with the deed, not just in word, not just saying things. You're proving it, demonstrating it, showing it. That's where true love lies. That's when you know when the words are genuine, when it comes to time. Now, there's not always a time where it's going to be genuine. You could tell people, hey, man, I care for you. I'm there for you. Whatever it is that you need, you have a problem, you know, the best I can, I'll help you out. You can say those things when a person's not in need. When it gets tested, though, okay, now I have a need. And let's not be the people that just love and word only. We just talk a big game. But you're not actually there when, when the time comes, you need to help somebody out. The Bible said here, let's not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And in fact, it's more important that you do the things that show your love than even just ever saying them. You don't ever have to tell somebody that you love them as long as you're there and will and we'll help them out and do the things for them and you're willing to give your, your, put your neck on the line for them and you actually follow through and do it even if you never told them <laughs> that you're there for them, right? It's more important that we love indeed and not in word only. Turn over to, to chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5. Loving indeed is your actions and loving in truth is not lying, right? Let's, let's love neither in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. So, you know, the false prophets are great at this, yep. at lying to people, telling them they love them, but that's not real love. Yeah. Lying to them, saying, oh man, everything's just great. You're just fine. Preaching peace, peace. Hey, people like to hear that, right? You might try to comfort people, make them feel better. Oh, I love you, so I'm, I'm preaching you a message of peace when there is no peace. You know, we don't want to go and, and say I'm being real loving. Oh, Joel Osteen, he's so loving, right? He's going to tell you how great you are. He's going to tell you how wonderful you are and how wonderful everyone is and how wonderful God is and how wonderful the world is. And isn't everything just great? Yeah, because he's a millionaire, a multimillionaire, and he's living the comfortable life and he's, and he's taking money from fools that are sending him in thinking that he's going to help them somehow. He's not loving in truth. It's a facade. It's a fake. He doesn't care about you. He cares about your money. We need to love in truth. Loving in truth means you're not lying. And you know what? When you love in truth, the truth is the truth. It has nothing to do with feelings at all. Truth is truth. So it's either right or wrong. Someone's doing something wrong, hey, give them the love and truth. Someone's doing something right, give them the love and truth. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, let's look at this verse real carefully and, and understand what it's saying. First of all, it's talking about salvation. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is a Christ is born of God. Amen. All you have to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do that, you are born of God. You're a child of God. Now it goes on further to say, And everyone that loveth him that begat... Loveth him also that is begotten of him. So if you are loving God, the Bible is saying you will also love other believers, other brethren. Now that's not saying everyone that's born of God loves God. It doesn't say that. Because just make sure you understand that this is just saying, well, first of all, everyone that's born of God is uh, or whosoever believeth is born of God. But if you, if you truly love God, 
you're going to love your brother in Christ. You know what that tells me? If you've got a brother in Christ that you don't love, the love of God's not in you. You're not loving God. Because if you love God, you would love your brethren. If you love God, you'd love them that's begotten of him. You may think you love God, but you don't. Not if you don't have love for the brother. I mean, that's, is that not what the verse is saying there? It's pretty clear. Black and white. Let's look at verse number two. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So the verse is tying these two things together, loving God and loving the children of God, loving other believers. It says, well, I know that I'm loving the children of God I know that I'm loving the children of God. I'm knowing that I'm loving other believers when I am loving God and keeping His commandments. Yeah. How, how is that possible? Because when you're keeping God's commandments, part of God's commandments is going to be helping, <laughs> helping your brothers and sisters in Christ. Read the Bible. Right? Read the commandments. And, and see that it's about loving your neighbor as yourself and other parts, right, where you're, you're going to do good unto your brother. So if you're keeping all of God's commandments, you will definitely be loving your brothers, loving the brethren, loving other believers, because those are part of God's commandments. Look at verse number three. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on here to flip over to John chapter 14. But on this concept, because this is also brought up in John chapter 14, this is the love of God. You want to have the love of God? Okay, here's how you have the love of God in your heart. We keep his commandments. You want to show God you love him? Keep his commandments. And he goes further to say, and you know what? His commandments are not grievous. It, it shouldn't be a big grief or sorrow to you or some big burden, you know, like, oh man, I can't believe I have to obey God's commandments. How is the love of God in you? He's saying, you want to love, show your love to God? You want to be someone who actually loves God? And you want to be able to say you love God and have it be genuine and real and not phony and fraud and fake according to God's word and God's eyes? He said, okay, you want to show me you love me? Listen to me, obey me. I've given you some rules to follow. You want to show me that you love me? Then how about you respect me and follow my words? Then I'll know you love me. And know that these aren't just some grievous commandments that I'm, that I'm laying some big burden on you to bear. God's actually looking out for us. And his commandments are designed to help us. But if you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. But see, Christians today want to separate the commandments of God from the love of God. They want to say, oh, we're in, don't you know we're in the New Testament? Why are you always going to these commandments? Why are we memorizing Deuteronomy chapter 6? Oh, I don't know, because Jesus Christ quoted, hey, this is the first and the great commandment, that we love God with all of our hearts and our soul and our mind. And the second is like unto it. You know where he's getting this from? The Old Testament. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love mankind. That is what the law and the commandments are about. So while we're focusing on loving God as a New Testament church, as we should, you know how we do that? We go to the commandments. We look at the Testament, the Old Testament. We look at these commandments and then follow them. You want to show God your appreciation, your love, and your respect for him and the fact that he was willing to give everything, if you didn't hear this morning's sermon, going all in on, on how much God loves us and you want to show God your gratitude for that, how about you start by listening to him? How about you start by keeping those commandments? John chapter 14, look at verse number 15. Maybe 1 John chapter 5 wasn't enough to, to convince you. How about the words of Jesus Christ? You're going to say you love Jesus? I don't know anyone who's, I don't know anyone in this room is going to say I don't love Jesus. Here's what Jesus Christ himself said. Look at John chapter 14, verse number 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. If you love me, do you love me? 
It's a question. Do you love me? If you love me, well, okay, well then keep my commandments. Now, do you think that the commandments of Jesus are somehow mysteriously different than the commandments of God? That Jesus is God. Isn't that what we believe here? Right. Yes? Yes? Amen. Amen. Amen? Jesus is God? Okay, good. Just as long as I make sure that's clear. I didn't stumble into a, a kingdom hall or, or, or a Mormon, you know, Latter-day Satan temple. No? Okay, good. I'm in a Baptist church still? Great. Yes, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. If you love me, keep my commandments. What, wait, wasn't it Jesus? We just went over this in our Bible study. Wasn't it Jesus that said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the commandments. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Wait, yeah, I think that was. It was, right? Brother Devin, is that Jesus Christ that said that? Amen. Okay, look. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of an attitude because I'm sick of this, this common Christian culture that wants to separate this, this mysterious love of God that everyone's supposed to have where they want to redefine what love is to just be some experience and some feeling and listen to your Christian contemporary music and make you feel closer to God. And that's how we're going to go, yes, the love of God. Man, church was great today. I just feel. There's nothing wrong with having a feeling or feeling close to God, okay? I'm not, I'm not mocking you if, you if you experience some level of feeling close to God, okay? But that's not what Jesus was talking about ever in the Scripture. And God, whatever, you know, however, wherever, how you want to slice it, when the Bible's talking about loving God, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about hearing him, listening, obeying, keeping the commandments because we're respecting God in that way. Okay, the Bible says in verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So it's like we're going to see this worded so many different ways. It's just, it's just how many different ways do you have to see it? And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And you'll notice throughout this, Jesus and the Father, it's going back and forth. Hey, if you love Jesus, you love the Father. And if you love the commandments, and keep the commandments. Jesus is going to love you. The Father is going to love you. You know, there's this whole, it all plays together. Whether you're looking at the commandments of Jesus, you're looking at the commandments of the Father, you know what? They're all the same commandments. The Bible says in verse 22, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. So again, there's the test. Are you keeping Jesus' words? Well, if you love him, he says you will. Kind of like, if you follow me, you'll be a fisher of men. If you love me, keep my words. There's a distinction here, and we need to understand this too. And I think many people here do, but I'm going to reiterate it anyways. People get confused on salvation and this lordship salvation that's taught by the likes of, of Paul Washer and John MacArthur and these Calvinists, and they want to say, where well, you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life and say, well, I have to be willing to follow him and do all these things and do all of these works, and that's the only way you could truly be saved is by doing all of these things and making sure that you're, you don't... No, by doing those things and by be willing to do those things, it shows your love for God. If you're keeping his commandments, you love him. Receiving a free gift. You can receive a gift from somebody that you don't love, but they love you. God, for God so loved the world that he gave. 
He paid the price. He gave his only begotten son. He bought and paid for this gift of eternal life, and he's offering it unto you. He doesn't say, in order to receive this, you have to love me back. He says you just have to believe. There's a big difference between believing, trusting, faith, and loving. Should we love God? <laughs> of course. That goes without saying. Listen to this morning's sermon. There's so many reasons why we should love God. Of course we should love God. But if we love God, what are we going to do? Keep His commandments? Do you have to keep the commandments to be saved? No. You just receive a free gift. But if you're going to love God, you better be keeping His commandments. Otherwise, you don't love Him. But it's just that simple. It's, it's very, this is not a complicated message. And there's nothing complicated about what the Scripture says either. Verse number 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Again, if you love me, you're keeping my sayings. If you don't love me, you're not going to keep them. Black and white. There's no gray area. There's no middle ground. Flip over to chapter 15. Again, this is another concept we're going to see here about Jesus Christ and how he views things. He views love as, okay, you love me, keep my commandments. Here's how Jesus Christ also views friendship with him. Are you the friend of Jesus? You want to know what the friend of Jesus does? Look at verse number 14. He says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. But that's not how my friendship works. It doesn't matter. That's how Jesus' friendships work. Yours don't have to work the way that Jesus works, but that's the way that Jesus' friendship works. Because he says, hey, you're my friends. Do whatever I command you to do. You say, well, why, did, why does that not sound? He explains himself in the next verse, though. Because that might just be like, whoa, what do you mean? Right? Verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants. Now, would it be totally reasonable to say that hey, we're God's servants? He's bought us and paid for us. He paid for all of our sins. We owe everything to him, our whole life, our soul, because he paid for everything for us. He bought us. He redeemed us. We're his purchased possession. We belong to God. But because he loves us, and wants to put us on the standing of being a friend and elevate us to that level, he's saying, okay, you can be my friend if you do what I tell you to do. We'll be friends. And here's what the benefit is of being a friend of Christ as opposed to just a servant. He's saying, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. The boss doesn't have to let his servants know everything about what he's doing. He's saying, you just do what I tell you to do. But I'm going to let you in on what's going on and I'm going to fill you in on, on all the details and that's why you're my friends because the friends have the inside knowledge the friends know what's going on the servants you just do what you're told and he says but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father I've made known unto you he said, I'm letting you I'm filling you on everything you're my friends but if you're going to be you know in order for you to be my friends you have to do what I tell you to do what Jesus said. <laughs> it's not, I'm not making stuff up. If you want to love him, keep his commandments. If you want to be his friend, keep his commandments. <laughs> you know, same thing, right? You love, Jesus is going to be friends with you if you love him. It sounds good to me. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 12. I've got a few sub points in my sermon tonight and um, I don't know, I don't know if this still goes on. So when I was younger, We'd get the, the newspaper, and in the Sunday newspaper, you have all the comics, right? Do they still have the comic section in newspaper? Does anyone even get the newspaper anymore? It is totally outdated. I don't know. Your grandma does. Amen for Brother Brian's grandmother. Do, do, are the Sunday, the, you know, some people call them the funnies, the, are they in there? Still doing that. That's pretty cool. When I was reading them, there used to be just this one little one. I actually thought it was kind of stupid because 
I'm a guy and I wasn't into that stuff. I like reading the funny stuff, right? I didn't like the political ones and things like that. But there was one that's called Love Is. Has anyone ever seen that? And I don't know if it's still around. And it was like a little, it was just like one picture. It wasn't like a whole series. It was just like one picture. And it, had, it always had like a, a drawing of like two, little, two kids, like a boy and a girl. And be like, love is holding hands. Love is, and it would just have like all these little slogans. It's supposed to be something cute, whatever. And it was just had a different thing in it every week. I don't know. I don't see, I don't see a lot of people going like, Pastor Burson's, now I feel really old. Or maybe it's just because I grew up in a different part of the country and, and they didn't have that here. Hopefully that's the case. <laughs> Anyways, if you, know, if you would have seen that, you know what I'm talking about. I have some sub points in my sermon about love. So like, love means obedience. We saw that. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, love is keeping Jesus' commandments. Love is chastening. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he? whom the Father chasteneth not. A loving father disciplines their children. So our Heavenly Father is going, if He loves you, He's going to discipline you. Now we, the reason why it's important for us to understand is because when you get disciplined, it's so much better when you understand it's because God loves you and not because he hates you. You know, little children sometimes don't understand. They'll be like, oh, you hate me because they're giving them a, a spanking, right? They think that, that, that it's just the worst thing in the world. Why are you doing this to me, right? Because they're, they're little and they don't understand. Now, I teach my children, you know, we give you these punishments because we love you. Because I'm trying to teach you right from wrong. I don't want you to do wrong. And if you don't do wrong, you won't get the punishment. And I'd rather have it that you get zero punishments from me. Because that means you're doing everything right. That means you're, you're, you're listening to me, you're obeying me. But as a father that loves my children and wants to make sure they don't start going down the wrong path, I need to, I need to keep them in line. And, and you know what? If you love your children, you'll chasten them. Chasten your children. Discipline them. If you really love, because what's the alternative? I don't really care. Right? The parent that's not willing to discipline their children when they're doing wrong is a, is a parent that doesn't care. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. And you may ask that parent, do you love your children? And they'll swear up and down, yes, I love my child. But according to Scripture, and I'm not going to go into the Proverbs and, and, and show that I could clearly demonstrate that this verse is enough. Because the Bible says, hey, if you're not enduring chast chastening, you're a bastard and not a son. Why? Because the father's not there. The father doesn't care. The father left. He took off. If you love your children, you'll chasten them. And that's why God chastens us. Now, as a child of God, you could have two attitudes. One of two, you can say, yep, I screwed up, but thank God God loves me to discipline me to, to make me not want to do that again. That hurt. I don't want to go down that path again. I'm going to learn from my mistakes and move forward. Or you can get bitter in your heart yeah. and go, well, well, you know what? I don't even want to go to church now. Oh, I don't want to do this now. Instead of just dealing with the chastening and saying, hey, at least I know God loves me. Because if he didn't love me, 
then I can just continue going off into whatever sin I want to do. And I'm not going to reap those consequences from God punishing me because I'm not his child. I'm just a bastard. But God does care about you. That's why you're being chased and that's why you're being disciplined. Don't add insult to injury. Don't add sin upon sin. Get your rear back right with God. I've had my kids sometimes, they get, you know, punished for one thing. And when they have a bad spirit about them, it doesn't happen very often, but when they have a bad spirit about them, they'll just go off and do something else that's wrong. That's because they're angry, because they're bitter, because they got in trouble for something else and they, and they think they shouldn't have got punished or whatever. And then they'll go off and do something else. Don't be like that child. Because just like I will, all right, bend over, here we go again. God's going to do the same thing. God's not going to get weary of the chastening. He'll just keep on doing it. And honestly, that's a good tip too for, for parenting, even though it's not really exactly what the sermon's about. Don't get weary with the discipline and the punishment. Don't, don't, let, don't let them be too stubborn to where you give in and stop giving out the punishments when necessary. That's backwards. You need to be the one who's saying every, you know, you're not going to win this battle. You want to have a battle of wills and you want to think you're going to do what you're going to do and I'm telling you something different. Every single time you are going to receive chastening. But the reason is because you love them. Because if you let them win in this battle of wills, in this battle of I'm going to do what's wrong, whether you're, regardless of what you're telling me to do, what that tells me is that you don't love them enough to, to just invest the time in that. And yeah, you know what? Sometimes other things just can't get done then. I know you're busy. We're all busy. I know, wives, you've got, a, you've got a lot of work to do at the home and cleaning up and doing everything else that you've got to do. But you know what? When it comes to your kids, if you're not disciplining them, you're not loving them. Right. And dads, same thing. You work, you're busy, you got a lot of things going on. I know what it's like, but you know what? My kids are more important to me. I'm going to make sure they get the discipline they need. And only when they need it. Obviously, you know, you don't, you don't discipline them for no reason. You discipline them because they've done something wrong. We're correcting them. And God does that for us. Love means chasing. Let's move on to the next one. Turn back to John. We'll go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Love means self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. You're willing to give of yourself for someone else. John chapter 15, look at verse number 9. And, and again, we have the example of Jesus Christ. John 15, 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And look, here it is again. We didn't turn to John. We turned to John 14 before. John 15, verse number 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Well, that's pretty interesting. He's saying, these things have I spoken. I, why am I telling you this? About keeping my commandments, and I love you. And hey, keep, if you keep my commandments, you're going to continue in my love. He said, if you do that, your joy is going to be full. I want you to be joyous. I want you to be happy. There is happiness and joy and comfort and peace in keeping God's commandments. It's all a good thing. It's not grievous. It's good for you. Get that right attitude realize this is good and you can be full of joy it when you have a stubborn and rebellious heart about being in submission or obedience whether it's submission and obedience to your husband or whether it's submission and obedience to god anybody who has a bad attitude about that in any case, in any commandment, it's, 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 you're not going to be joyful at all. You're going to be bitter. You're going to be upset. You're going to be angry. You're going to have strife. 
But when you can just say, OK, I'll obey. I'll listen. I'll submit myself to whatever the authority is that God has given in the scripture, your joys will be full. And obviously, the ultimate authority is God. And every other thing is given, any other authority is given by God. And if it's not given by God, then it's not an authority. Verse number 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Well, here's a commandment. Jesus said, you want to keep, you know, you want to abide in my love, keep my commandments. You want to be my friend, do whatever I say. You love me, keep my commandments. Well, here's a commandment. You love one another as I have loved you. Now, how did Jesus love us? He gave his life for us. And he's done many other things, right? He healed, he, he preached, he did, you know, taught the truth. He didn't love in word only, but in deed and in truth. Look at verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the love that Jesus had for us. He's saying that's the love that you ought to have. Turn, flip back to Luke chapter 6. So if we love God, what are we going to do? We're going to keep his commandments. If we love God, we're going to love God not just in word, but in deed and in truth. If we love God, we're going to be obedient to him. If we love God, we know we're going to endure chastening when we do wrong. If we love God, we're going to have self-sacrifice. We're going we're to put others before us. We're going we're to esteem other better than yourself. That's love. That's true love. That's pure love. That's when you're showing and demonstrating your love for someone. You're willing to give for them. I'll go through some suffering so that you don't have to. Jesus Christ went through some hell so that we don't have to. We, we can't do that, but what we can do is go through other things. We can take on other burdens. Luke 6, look at verse number 31. Luke 6, 31. Love means mercy and grace. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. He's saying the type of love that I'm telling you to have isn't just, oh, well, you, you're doing good to me, so I'm going to love you. I talked about that this morning, too. If we're going to have the love that God is telling us to have, we need to be able to love people like he loved people, loving the unlovable, loving the people who don't love you back. Verse 33, and if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. We went over this this morning. You're a child of God if you're born again. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you're born again. You're in God's family. You're a child of God. Well, as a child of God, why don't you be merciful as your father is merciful? He said, why don't you demonstrate the same type of love, the same type of spirit that God has? If you're really a child of God, why don't you do those things? And when we can understand how God gave his life for everyone now, hey, that's how we ought to be living. Easy words to agree with because you see them written on a page, a lot harder to put into practice. Don't let the words go in and out tonight. Okay? I, I, don't, I, I wish I knew a better way of trying to help people to instill this in you for the rest of the week and for the rest of your life. I don't know how to do that. That's up to you to take what you hear tonight or any day or any, any service, what you receive from the Word of God, and, and apply that. Everyone has different situations that you're dealing with where this might be applicable, where you have some enemy, where you have someone that, you know what? You need to love that person even though they don't love you. Because if all you are doing is just loving the people who are doing good to you, you're just like anyone else. 
because everybody's like that. This is a higher standard that Jesus is trying to hold us to. This is a higher level that we've fallen short of, but he's telling us, this is where I want you to be. God lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust. He doesn't have to do that, but he does it. There are blessings to people who hate God. Just, just by virtue of having food and having clothing and having things that God has provided for them. And God has given to people like that. All, to, all manner of people. The way that we live our lives, he says, hey, you have enemies, love your enemies. Do good and lend. Don't, hope for, don't, hope, don't just give people stuff when you're hoping to get something back from them. Be willing to give of yourself without ever getting anything back. That's the type of love and the attitude and the, and the, and the mercy and long-suffering that God has. And that's what we ought to try to reflect in our life, that same type of love. Flip over to um, he, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. It's the last place we'll turn tonight. Ephesians chapter 4. The last point, love means edification. I'm going to read for you from Hebrews 10. It's a, it's a common verse that, that I've gone over, I think, multiple times lately. But Ephesians chapter 4 is where you're turning. Love means edification. Hebrews 10 talks about us coming together in the church and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. God wants us to be encouraged. The love of God is going to encourage us and we ought to love the brethren and love other people and encourage one another unto love and good works and help other people out. You know, being that type of a minister is, is part of what love is and having love. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 29. Ephesians 4, 29, the Bible reads, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That, you know, this whole topic of, you know, commu you know, corrupt communication coming out of your mouth, the words that we speak, this is an entire series of sermons that we could preach. Be aware of the language that you use, of the, of the words that you use, of, of everything that comes out of your mouth, because all words have meaning and they all have impact on people. And be careful that you're using words that are good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're try your whole life you should be trying to help, trying to help people. Whether it be help lead the lost to Christ, help your brothers or sisters in Christ, wherever they need help, right? Being a minister, not being worried about what you can get for yourself and being self-centered, being other-centered. That, that's the attitude, that's the love that, that God had, that Christ has, and that we ought to have too. Uh, verse number 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is love. Being able to say, I forgive you. And not just say it, but mean it. Because part of forgiving is forgetting. If you'd throw something back in someone's face that they did before that you've already forgiven them of, you didn't ever really forgive them. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness means this isn't brought up ever again. Imagine, I mean, imagine if God says, oh yeah, you're forgiven of your sins, and then all of a sudden you die, you go to heaven, and then what about this? What about this? What about this? I, I thought I was forgiven. I don't have an answer. I screwed up. It's, you're not just going to be 
have this continually. The best of all, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as God separates from our sin. If that's what God does with our sin, well, why don't you be able to forgive your brothers and sisters and truly forgive them and let it, let it be as far as the east is from the west and not throw something back in their face? Nobody wants to have that. And, and you know what? What does that do? Just tears them down. Is that edifying? Is that going to lift them up to throw something back in someone's face that they've already repented of, that they've already said they were sorry for, that they've already admitted they were wrong on, that you've already forgiven them on? What's the point? What's the point? You're just going to tear them down. Not as comfortable of a sermon tonight as it was this morning. Because this is our side of things. Man, that felt good hearing about how much God loves us. You know, it felt, preaching, it felt good preaching on that too. I, I love how much God loves us. This is great. But let's show our love to God, but let's understand what that means. What does it mean to show our love for God? have a Christ-like attitude, a Christ-like spirit. If th there is no higher, greater love than, than God's love, God is love, well then that's the example that we need to be following. Jesus Christ did a lot of work showing his love for us, so that's why tonight's sermon isn't as comfortable because it means you, if you want to show love for someone else and have real love for someone else, it's going to require effort and work and it's going to put you out and it's going to put you in a position of maybe giving of yourself and, and laying your life down for your friends, possibly, you know, whatever. That's, the, that, that's not as comfortable. But that's how you truly show your love for someone. And just like I believe in strong families, I believe in a strong church family too. You know, your family, you, your family, you ought to be able to have a family that says, hey, whatever happens to you, I'm there for you. People in the world can even understand this. That's not a hard concept to, get, to grasp, especially among people or cultures or just families that, that have a strong bond. Like, hey, you're my brother. You're my sister. You're my mom. You're my dad. You know, I'm there for you. I mean, that's the way I feel about my family. Even the ones I'm not as close with, hey, if they have a problem, guess what? I'm going to be there. Why? Because I'm their brother. Because I'm their, their son. I'll be there for them. But that's not just limited to my, my physical, natural family, that actually should abound to the church as a family. And then even being able to show the love for people outside and have mercy and compassion and love towards people that aren't even saved. Because that's what Christ had. I don't want our church to be so holier than thou. Well, I don't want the church to be holier than thou at all. But just thinking that like, oh, you're unsaved. You're unsaved. I can't talk. Look, it doesn't mean they're going to be your best buddies and you're just going to have every, you know, you shouldn't be having everything in common with people and just spending all your time with them. But at the same time, you can love these people and try to show them grace and mercy and, and, and try to do things for them. God, God does things for the unsaved all the time. There's a lot of love there. God, so lo God loved you before you got saved. Jesus loved you before you got saved. He loved you enough to die on the cross and he gave himself for you. Just saying, don't start having this attitude that's too warped and skewed against unsaved people. Oh, I, I'm not going to love them because they're unsaved, but I'll love my brethren. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we, uh, we love you, and I pray that you would please just work in our hearts and our spirits and, and help us to show us your love that um, by, by keeping your commandments, by listening to what you have to say, by reading your words, receiving instruction, Lord, I pray that you please just, just open up knowledge and wisdom unto us, dear God, and that uh, we know that, that if we just ask 
that you'll, you'll give to us liberally. And um, Lord, help us to have the right spirit and to understand how we ought to be dealing with, with all the people in our lives. Lord, help us to have a spirit that's closer to uh, Jesus Christ where, where he was able to give of himself. And um, Lord, we love you. Help our church to grow and, and just help us to reach more people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.